We've seen a few examples of martingales now. In order to build up our library of them, it will be useful to be able to produce new ones from old ones or from other kinds of processes. Here we're going to focus on how we can produce martingales or sub or super martingales by taking functions of other martingales or other kinds of stochastic processes. First, here's a very simple proposition. Suppose that Xn is a martingale. We'd like a function of it to be a martingale. Well, that can be challenging, although at the end of this lecture we'll see some examples, but it's relatively easy to produce functions of martingales that are sub-martingales. And that we can achieve by taking a convex function of any martingale. And we can do better as well. Suppose we only know that our original process Xn is a sub-martingale then a convex function of it will also be a sub-martingale, provided that that function is also an increasing function. So let's quickly prove this. First of all, suppose that we start with a martingale, and phi is a convex function, not necessarily increasing. Since xn is a martingale, xn is equal to xn plus 1 conditioned on fn. And now, taking phi of that, we'll use the conditional Jensen's inequality that we proved earlier to see that that's less than or equal to the conditional expectation on fn of phi of xn plus 1. And of course, that shows us exactly that phi of xn is a sub-martingale. Of course, implicit here is the assumption that we need that phi of xn is L1 for every n, since that's part of the definition of martingale or sub-martingale. Now, suppose that we only know that xn is a sub-martingale to start with. Can we make this same argument? Well, almost. What we would need to do is to be able to have a less than or equal to sign there. Now, sub-martingale means that xn is less than or equal to that conditional expectation, and we'd like to be able to pass the phi through the conditional expectation, and that's exactly what increasing means here. So if we assume in this case that phi is a non-decreasing function, it will then follow that phi of xn is less than or equal to phi of this conditional expectation. And then following exactly the same argument above, we get that that's less than or equal to the conditional expectation of phi of xn plus 1, which shows that phi of xn is a sub-martingale. One nice place this will come up frequently is when our function phi of x is x to the p, which is convex for all p greater than or equal to 1, even if we take absolute values first. So, for example, if we know that xn is an LP martingale, p bigger than or equal to 1, then the sequence of xn absolute value to the p is a sub-martingale. And since the function x to the p is also increasing here without absolute values, we therefore can take xn to be any non-negative LP sub-martingale and still find that the sequence of pth powers is a sub-martingale. Now, what if we want the result, the function of a process, to actually be a martingale, not just a sub-martingale? That's more subtle. And actually, one nice rich place to get such examples is to start not necessarily with a martingale, but with a Markov chain. We've seen one example of a Markov chain that is also a martingale, that is the symmetric random walk on the integer lattice. But let's ignore the fact that it's a martingale. In fact, most of the time, if you have a Markov chain, even if it happens to be on a real state space, there's no reason to think that it will also be a martingale. The two classes are different kinds of stochastic processes. However, there is a nice way to produce from any Markov chain a martingale by taking some kinds of functions of that Markov chain. And here is the result slash procedure. Start with a time homogeneous Markov chain on some state space S. Let's let Q denote the transition operator of that Markov chain, and here we're thinking of it starting in some particular deterministic state. If f is a function of two variables, the time variable and the state variable that is real valued, and if it satisfies the following integrability condition, that is, that the function of our Markov chain and the time parameter n is L1 for every n, then we can produce a martingale, Zn, by taking that function of the Markov chain, provided that function relates to the transition operator in this nice way. 
If I take that function of the space variable and apply the transition operator to it, what I should get is the function at one time step earlier. Any function satisfying this kind of recursive relation will produce a martingale, Zn, from the Markov chain. And in fact, we could produce a sub-martingale if we only want this to be less than or equal to here. Now, in particular, if we don't want our function f to depend on n and we're just taking f of xn, then this condition here is the statement that f is a fixed point for our transition operator q, which are the kind of functions that we've studied already ad nauseum, particularly in the random walk context. The proof of this is literally one line long. If I take the expected value of zn given fn, well, zn is defined to be this function here. And how do I take the expected value of some function of a Markov chain at a future time, given the time up to the present by the Markov property and the very definition of the transition kernel that is computed exactly by taking the transition operator applied to the function evaluated at xn. The transition kernel is the regular conditional distribution of the process at time n and n plus 1 by definition. And so if our function f satisfies this equation here, then that is exactly equal to f of n and xn, which is definition of zn, and so we get the martingale property holding. And of course, if instead we only have that this is less than or equal to here, then we'll get that this is less than or equal to here, and we'll get a sub-martingale as desired. Great. Now, how do we find such functions? Well, there's one way we can always make this work, not starting with any function, but actually ending with any function that we want, provided we're willing to only restrict ourselves to a finite time interval. That is, if we take some fixed but large time t and consider the time interval from 0 up to t, then what we can do is run the Markov chain backwards. In other words, consider the following function, f of n and a state y, is given by, well, start with any function g that you want at the end time, at time t, and then let f of n and y be the transition operator to the power t minus n applied to g at y. Then we can quickly verify that if I take q of f at time n plus 1 and blah, that's q of, okay, well, by definition, that's q to the power t minus n plus 1, applied to g. So this is t minus n minus 1, and now we're applying q, so that's q to the t minus n. But that is f of n and blah, and that's exactly what we needed. So that shows by our theorem up here that this finite time interval martingale from time 0 up to time t, which is defined to be g of xt at the end point, that is a martingale. Now we'd love to be able to continue this past the time t, but of course that would require taking negative powers of q, and that may not be possible. Our operator q might not be invertible in any reasonable sense, but there are situations where it is, and we can use this kind of construction in order to produce a martingale for all time. Let's look at such an example right now. Consider again the random walks on the integer lattice with some drift parameter p. So for those, the transition operator applied to a bounded function has this nice simple form. p times a step to the right plus 1 minus p times a step to the left. And let's just, for the sake of clarity, fix x0 to start at 0. Now in this case, if we want our function that we're going to take of our Markov chain to not depend on the time step n, well, we've already classified exactly all of the functions f that have the property that qf equals f. And here they are right here. It's a two-parameter family of exponential functions. So what that means is that if I take one of those functions for any two real parameters alpha and beta, of the Markov chain xn, this will be a martingale. Now, by the way, it's easy to check that the class of martingales is a vector space. Any linear combination of two martingales is a martingale. And since the constant 1 is a martingale, 
the fact that you have a two-parameter family here isn't so interesting. The only interesting part is that this is a martingale. That is actually easy to check directly here and worth doing. If I let lambda denote this ratio, 1 minus p over p, and remembering that we can construct this Markov chain xn as the progressive sum of n iid random variables, each of which has distribution p times a step to the right plus 1 minus p times a step to the left, then this conditional expectation of this function of x at time n plus 1, well, that's the conditional expectation given fn of lambda to the xn plus xn plus 1. Now, lambda to the xn is fn measurable, so I can pull that out of the conditional expectation, and I'm left with just the conditional expectation of lambda to the xn plus 1, but Xn plus 1 is independent from all the previous ones and therefore independent from Fn. And so this conditional expectation is actually just the plain old expectation. But we can compute that because we have the distribution of Xn right here. So that's just equal to lambda to the Xn times P times lambda to the 1 plus 1 minus P times lambda to the minus 1. Well, lambda was equal to 1 minus p over p. So this is the following expression. And we can check that those add up to 1, which shows that this conditional expectation is this. That is, we have the martingale property. And so lambda to the xn is a martingale for this particular ratio, lambda here. So. That's the whole story on functions of this Markov chain that don't depend on n producing a martingale. Although we'll see later that we can get some leverage out of that. Can we get more leverage if we allow that function to depend on n as well? Well, here's a nice little calculation motivated by what we just did. If I fix any parameter lambda not equal to zero and I apply q to this exponential function with base lambda, by the definition up here of the transition operator q, that is p times lambda to the x plus 1 plus 1 minus p lambda to the x minus 1. And what I'm going to do using the fact that I can take 1 over lambda is factor out of that p lambda plus 1 minus p lambda to the minus 1, leaving me with lambda to the x. That shows that the action of q on functions of the form lambda to the x is by multiplying them by this function here. And for non-zero lambda, this is an invertible function, which means that if we restrict to the span of exponential functions, we really can take q inverse. So in other words, if I define the following class of functions, for each fixed lambda, f of n and x is this factor here to the power of minus n times lambda to the x, well, that's just formally q to the minus n applied to lambda x. And not formally, we can just quickly, easily do the calculation that it will follow that right from here, q applied to this function at time n plus 1 will be that function at time n. And so what that means is that provided that all of the steps are in L1, which we know we'll get if x0 is bounded so that all of these applied to xn are bounded by induction. If I define mn to be that function of n and xn, that function there, that will be a martingale. That's more general than the one we had here. Lambda can be anything we want here, where we've corrected with this correction term out front in order to retain the martingale property. And we can get a lot of leverage from that. And let me just highlight one thing we can do with it. If I change variables slightly here and write lambda in the form e to the theta for some real parameter theta, so now I'm taking lambda strictly positive, we've just shown that this function for any fixed parameter theta satisfies the right recurrence relation, which shows us that that function of n and xn, where xn is our biased random walk, is a martingale. Now, notice that this function certainly depends smoothly on theta. 
And also, if I look at the action of Q on a function, that action there, which is a very simple finite sum difference type action, will certainly commute with derivatives. And so it's easy to justify that if I differentiate this function in the parameter theta, that will produce a new function, which also satisfies the desired relation. And then I could evaluate that function at any value of theta. So in particular, if I take any number of derivatives of this smooth function in the theta parameter and evaluate it theta equal to zero, then that function will also satisfy the given recurrence here. And as a result, that function of the random walk will be a martingale. If you do that taking k equal to one or k equal to two, then you can calculate that you have the following two martingales associated with the biased random walk of parameter p. Remember, the biased random walk is not a martingale itself unless p is equal to one half. In that special symmetric case, we do get a martingale, but if p is bigger than one half, we get a sub-martingale, and if p is less than one half, we get a super-martingale. Well, it turns out that we can correct for that easily, and that by itself would be easy to check. That is, if I take xn minus n times this drift here, that I do get a martingale. That's what we get from the first derivative here. And if I take the second derivative here, I get the following harder to understand on its own, but very useful property. If I then square this compensated martingale here, and then shift it again by a linear function of n, then that quadratic function of our random walk is also a martingale. You're going to run through the details of all of this on your homework. And let me just note that the fact that these are martingales is extremely useful because as we'll shortly see, we can use martingales stopped at a stopping time in order to compute all sorts of statistics of those stopping times with the use of one of the main results for martingale theory, the optional sampling theorem.